Dear Lord. So you want to talk about? Okay. Well, okay. So we're doing food storage. Go ahead and start. You talk about food storage. Okay. Are we ready? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're on. You're already on. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Should we look at each other? This is what I, I have to understand. <laughs> so Should we look sad. at each other? My name is Joanna Stevens, and I'm the curator for the Battle of Franklin Trust. I'm Beth Trescott. I'm the collections manager. We've been working on a couple of things at Carter House in Carnton to try and share more information about things that we know, things that we can't fit into a 60 minute or a 90 minute tour. There's just never enough time. Never enough time. It seems like. What we want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about today is food. Who doesn't love food? Because we have to eat. <laughs> and because we all are human. And it's something we can relate to for the people that live here. That's right. So we're sitting on the porch at Carter House today. And back behind us is actually the Carter House kitchen. So obviously it's a brick single room structure. It was here the day of the battle in 1864. What we have to think about is what did they do in the 19th century that's different from today in terms of food preparation, harvesting, who's preparing the food, what type of food are they eating? There are no drive throughs No drive throughs no Chick-fil-A. And speaking of chicken, oh my gosh. <laughs> Remember my story about chicken with my grandmother? Oh yes, my gosh. That's true. So, wringing the chickens' necks in the yard would probably not be my favorite thing to do. I think I didn't eat chicken for maybe 10 years. For families like the Carters and the McGavicks that we talk about, of course, the most in the 19th century, they owned slaves mm -hmm. before the Civil War. The vast majority, if not all, of the food harvesting, preparation, cooking, serving, cleaning was done by those enslaved women. Absolutely. When one meal is done, you're already having to prepare for the next meal. The fire is never going out. So much of the food that we prepared for the tasting, mm -hmm. which you can see in the video podcast, we had such fun making 19th century recipes. And some of those were actually from the Carter family, descendants of Fountain Branch Carter. And they compiled their own family recipes, some from the 1800s, some from the early 20th century, all of that, they allowed us to look at that cookbook, which was a family mm -hmm. thing. And Treasure. it was so wonderful to see and read the stories associated with the recipes. And all I can think about, one, is I would probably never eat those things, but two, who prepared those things? Yeah. And the time that it would have taken. So much time. Um, I made a couple of recipes for the tasting. Bread was one of them. The time for it to rise, to do all of that, enslaved labor here before the war, and then contracted labor after the Emancipation Proclamation and after the war has ended, they still have black laborers who are here at Carrington and at Carter House preparing the food. There's not a lot of information really for enslaved laborers at either site. Christy, she has uncovered so much information about them that was previously unknown to us, but the challenge is that so much of that comes post-war, but we do know a couple of women who were cooking at the two sites. So when they were doing that, how they learned those skills, it's just been part of a learning process for us. So we know Susan was an enslaved woman who was actually the cook over at Carter House immediately after the war. So of course, we don't know for certain, we don't have a slip of paper that says she was there before day the war or, whatever. or the day of the mm -hmm. battle, but the logical conclusion is, of course, that she was. How else would she have been familiar with what was going on mm -hmm. there? And the same could be said for, for Frankie, Frankie yeah. who was here. November of 1853, Carrie McGavick, her father, Van Winder, came up from Louisiana and purchased several enslaved individuals here in Franklin. And then he actually gifts those people to her. So this is the bill of sale from 3.15 p.m. November 1st, 1853, and it actually describes a Negro woman named Frankie, aged about 38 years old, and her infant son, Andrew, aged about four years. So Frankie and her son come and live here. But what we've learned also mm -hmm. is that they were here, we know, after the war. Yes, and from a labor contract that Rick Warwick put together, we have an agreement that I'm just gonna read between her husband and John McGavick, which disturbs me in so many ways, being a woman. She wasn't even able to make her own contract. Mm -hmm. um, she had to make it between John, a former master, mm -hmm. and, yes, yeah. and her mm -hmm. husband. This is part of it. This agreement and contract made and entered into the sixth day of January, 1866, by and between John McGavick of the one part and Miles McConaughey colored and his wife Frankie of the second part. And Frankie, wife of said Miles, obligates herself to perform all kitchen yard 
and household work for the coming year, maintain a quiet, orderly, and respectful demeanor, and to require the same and implicitly of her children. And the first party, John, obligates and binds himself to pay said Frankie $7 per month commencing the first day of January 1866 and ending the first day of January 1867. $7 a month in 1866 equates to, I put it in the inflation calculator for 2020, and it came right out to $112. Think about women in the 19th century and what they had to go through on a daily basis, both black and white. Some people had washing day, cooking day, laundry day, and a lot of that revolved around buildings like the Carter Kitchen. And this yard would be so busy and so full of activities. The kitchen yard, if we want to really think about it, like right here at Carter House, that's where laundry was likely taking place. And sometimes the same person who did the cooking was doing the laundry because mm -hmm. that fire was going, you could heat up that water, you could do all of that stuff, mm -hmm. and the tasks uh, were just endless. And the water, think about like here, exactly. they had to get the water from the well, mm -hmm. which is of course strategically located, that's so you right. don't have to walk far back down to where our parking lot is today for the spring, mm -hmm. that would just be way too hard. Mm -hmm. And at Carnton, the spring house down a hill, up that you had to go to carry all that up mm -hmm. to the house in that kitchen yard. Weight, the strength, the physicality. I think, I think everything mm -hmm. that we're talking about reminds me how fortunate we are to live when we do. I Absolutely. think sometimes when people talk about, oh, I, I was wish I was born back then. Oh, no. I so romantic. Think, oh, my oh, goodness. No. So much more work. <laughs> so difficult. Food preparation. During harvest time, what are you doing with those crops? You have to find ways to preserve them, to dry them, to can them. There's just a lot of things to consider, and it never ends. Never. Because every, you had to use everything. Everything. This idea of throwing things away. Of, Not happening. Uh, all of that. Forget it. Food preservation was vital. What you grew was vital. What you canned and preserved and stored was vital. When we see crocs today, we usually see them at like antique stores or that kind of thing. And people use them as decorative pieces. But in the 19th century, they were, what were we saying the other day? It's like the Pyrex or the Tupperware yes, of the absolutely. day. So it's a reusable storage container. And so it was so important, so thick walled, Crocs yes. and of different sizes for different types of things. And we've actually found down the hill here at Carnton in the archaeological dig in the kitchen mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then by the spring house and, and the, the one yeah. slave house that remains, we found shards uh, of crocs, so fragments. And those and lug handles. Exactly. Yeah. Storage of food, those receptacles was very, very important and it's something that was all over this farm, Carter House, any farm, any home that had a garden really in yes. the 19th century, that's how they were storing their additional produce. So a lot of sauerkraut, of course, was made in crocs and that's a great way to preserve something lasts a long time you got your cabbage cabbage easy to grow in the garden I think we have some growing right now surely um, they didn't have sauerkraut in the south you don't think so they didn't have any German people <laughs> bringing the sauerkraut Scotch Irish <laughs> I didn't want that sauerkraut but that was a good way to preserve things in the 19th century a lot of vinegar yes fermented things as well and you mentioned also drying absolutely um, hanging up things to mm -hmm, dry for mm -hmm. herbs and then those herbs could be round mm -hmm. into different types of spices and then stored like in those tins mm -hmm. that we have. And even though you had dry goods stores and places in town where you could go and purchase some things, it was cost prohibitive many times for families. We used to have mm -hmm. a, a pepper in here, I'm not sure we do yeah. this year. It's called a fish pepper. And I thought, mm -hmm. what the heck is a fish pepper? But it was the pepper to spice and um, what am I trying to say? Season. Season, thank you. So kind of like the McCormick's or Old Bay of the 19th century <laughs> out there. So at both sites, we have smokehouses. And it's kind of a, a misnomer in some ways because they are always referred to as smokehouses, mm -hmm. but they're not smoking all the time, first of all, and it's not mm -hmm. the smoking that preserves the meats, it's the brining. Exactly. So in those big logs, those hollowed out logs at both Carter House and Carnton our smokehouses, mm -hmm. you can see the spaces where hams would be, multiple ham hocks and jowls and things would have been put into a salt brine and that they would have stayed there for several weeks maybe months, and become so preserved mm -hmm. that when they were cured, whatever that would have been for them and the time period that it took for it to mm -hmm. occur, then they would hang them up in the rafters, prepare a little fire, different kinds of hickory and oak and... A lot of fruit trees they yes, used as well. To get those yes. extra special mm -hmm. good barbecue tastes. <laughs> <laughs> you can still smell that smoky flavor, if you will. Yeah. 
in the bricks, which is so cool. And that's what I think is so important, a power of place, you know, when you mm -hmm. come to these sites, how important they are for our history, how important they are to tell both sides of a story, how important they are to mm -hmm. remember what went on. I'll be in trouble. Well, I did kind of want to be down in the smokehouse, but that's okay. I won't cry. But it was too hot, you said, it so hot. it's a little steamy. I can already feel my hair getting bigger as I sit here. Bigger, bigger, bigger. <laughs> you guys ready? No.